Welcome to Common Hour. My name is Anne Stachura, and I'm the coordinator for community-based learning and community outreach in the Spanish department, and I am chair of the Common Hour committee this fall. I'd like to introduce our ASL interpreter, Emily Phipps. Thank you, Emily, for interpreting for us at Common Hour. Please note that if you need to change your screen view to include Emily as you watch, you can adjust the screen display mode in the small box labeled view towards the upper right of the Zoom window. You can enable the CC closed captioning if you like. A very warm welcome to all at our first Common Hour of the semester. Common Hour is a unique and inclusive program that brings the Franklin and Marshall community together weekly during the academic year for culturally and intellectually enriching events. It is the only regularly scheduled event that unites students, faculty, and staff, and invites the larger community to join us. Throughout the pandemic, the Common Hour has continued to provide a virtual gathering space and a source of inspiration, education, and compelling discussion for the FNM community and beyond. We hope you will join us during Common Hour next week for an in-person Now Hour event, how to propose a super Common Hour event in the Bonchek Great Room. Come gather to enjoy soup and bread and hear from students about how to propose a Common Hour event. Our next virtual Common Hour will be on September 22nd and will feature Andrew Curran, the William Armstrong Professor of the Humanities at Wesleyan University and his talk, Who's Black and Why? The 18th Century Origins of Race Biology. Please follow the Common Hour on our webpage, the events calendar, and our FNM Common Hour Facebook and Instagram pages. During today's event, Zoom viewers can submit questions for our speakers via the Q&A feature. Please indicate your affiliation with the college, but we do not need your name. And now I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Barbara Altman, President and Professor of French. Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much, Anne. That was a great setup for another year of Common Hour. I'm really honored to have the first slot of the year again. It's um, it's a lovely tradition to ask the president to launch the series. I look forward to the day when we can be doing this in person again. But as we've, as we've learned, Zoom is not a bad alternative, and we've gotten much better at it. So far better to be meeting for Common Hour by Zoom than not to be doing it at all. So thank you for those who are here. And of course, it's impossible for me to see. Well, actually, that's not true. I do see a list of participants, so I know who's with us. One of the things I love best about Common Hour is that we can bring in all of our campus constituencies and every member of the campus community can get on and take an hour to think about big topics, think about big thoughts, think about what affects us as a community and um, what's going on in the world around us. So when we had to pick a title for this opening session of the fall, and we picked um, preparing the leaders of tomorrow, I was very aware at the time that it sounds like one of the slogans you might find is the tagline for any particular institution of higher ed. But the fact of the matter is, is that we actually do prepare the leaders of tomorrow, probably more successfully than many of our peers. And so I wanted to talk about leadership because it has been very much on my mind. It seemed like a good uh, thing to start with this term and this year, because in my time at FNM, which is now four years, I'm very happy to say that um, I'm in my fifth year as president, I've really come to understand that leadership, that the characteristic of leadership and that the training and preparation for leadership is one of the defining characteristics of FNM. I think it sets us apart from some of our peer and aspirant schools. I think it's something we have been doing very successfully for decades and even centuries. And I do believe that it's one of the things that we are going to discover 
as we uh, look for ways to make ourselves more visible in the world, it's going to be one of those things we discover as a great asset of FNM. And one of the reasons that we can offer a really tremendous preparation for students here because of what they get to do and how they get to do it. It's no surprise that we have chosen the word LEAD, L-E-A-D, as the acronym, the short title for our strategic plan. And um, there'll be a public facing version of that on the website pretty soon. It's uh, everywhere. Leadership training is everywhere on campus when you start to look for it, when you start to recognize it. There are myriad opportunities on campus for students to develop their leadership skills. And just a few of those are the College House Governments, DIPCON, the way athletics has its own leadership training program, the, the programming for various cohorts like our posse students, and uh, the all the work that student affairs done it does, which is based on um, on that personal skills development, that professionalization development that makes our students so very ready to move on once they graduate from F and M, and it's of course deeply, deeply, deeply embedded in our way of educating. It's the responsibility that students take when they engage in experiential learning uh, initiatives. It's the responsibility that students take when they uh, participate in group projects. And we do a lot of that kind of work. It's in what we expect of students and what you, what the faculty teach them when they engage in original research as mentored and supervised by faculty. So we do have a great deal of leadership training inherent in, embedded in, deliberately emphasized by the way we fulfill our educational mission. And in fact, when we recognize that this was a strength of so many of our students and that we help them cultivate those skills while they are with us, one of the new initiatives that we piloted through admission this year is to create a special kind of financial aid that is a leadership, uh, uh, that recognizes leadership, that is designated for incoming students who have demonstrated real leadership in their high school and previous education. And that has gone very well. It means that we're right, that the students who apply here often are already distinguished young leaders and they're looking to develop that particular asset for themselves because they're really engaged citizens and want to function effectively in the world. So one of the ways we need to get, uh, get our voice out there more is taking the message to the public in the face of a lot of public skepticism about how a true liberal arts education like an F&M education is actually one of the best possible preparations for taking leadership in a complicated world. In order to help do that, and it's a, it's a big lift, it's a big task, it's a daunting task. Liberal arts colleges and the higher ed academy in general haven't done a very good job of um, explaining what liberal arts really do, what they really are, and why they're such a critically important kind of education these days. So I've been writing more op-ed pieces. I've been speaking both locally and nationally. I've been working with the local Lancaster community and Lancaster County community on the needs of our workforce here, right in and around Lancaster and what the term workforce preparation really means in the broader sense. When people talk about workforce preparation, they generally think about programs that train for a specific skill. And those are critically important programs. We really need great master plumbers. We really need people who can run IT systems. We really need people who can um, maintain HVAC systems. All of that is the infrastructure and um, that on which we all depend. And so I'm in no way minimizing the importance of those. Our colleagues at, um, at Thaddeus Stevens, for example, across town do very, very important work and train a huge amount of our workforce. But what I have been taking out into the larger world is the ways in which a liberal arts education where students are very broadly cross-trained in a number of dis different disciplines 
is a really good way to prepare students who are interested in that kind of training. And not everyone is, and not everybody needs to be or should be, but how that kind of training, how what we do, our kind of education is actually terrific training for a very complicated world. Uh, tonight, I'll be in Washington, D.C. as one of 13 liberal arts college presidents meeting with the National Higher Ed Press. And this is one of my main messages for that group of journalists. And I think we can make a great case about how we can demonstrate that our kind of education really prepares our graduates extremely well for the, for the complicated problems they're taking on for discovering all of the big questions, for defining those questions, and for finding the opportunities that are out there alongside with all of the intractable, daunting challenges that this generation is going to face on behalf of us all. So I'm trying to uh, not only to bring that more into public conversation, but also to do it on behalf of Franklin and Marshall. And uh, it'll be an interesting experience with those other 12 liberal arts college presidents this evening in DC with a skeptical press that likes to emphasize the negative. So what we're bringing is the positive message and uh, finding a way to make that as compelling to the public opinion and to the press as all of the difficult stuff. I think it's a good time at the beginning of the year and at the beginning of Common Hour actually to think about our college mission. It's pretty brief. So I'm actually gonna take the time to read the mission briefly here. I bet you there are people on this Common Hour, in this Common Hour audience who can, who can uh, recite it by heart or your particular favorite parts of it, but I'm gonna read it anyway, because it's a useful grounding for us as we head into another year. And it's a year, by the way, that I think is off to a tremendously good start. So here's what we have on our website as our mission statement. Franklin and Marshall College is a residential college dedicated to excellence in undergraduate liberal education. Its aims are to inspire in young people of high promise, and diverse backgrounds, a genuine and enduring love for learning, to teach them to read, write, and think critically, to instill in them the capacity for both independent and collaborative action, and to educate them to explore and understand the national, social, and cultural worlds in which they live. In so doing, the college seeks to foster in its students qualities of intellect, creativity, and character that they may live fulfilling lives. That's a really important piece of this. We want our students to be prepared to live fulfilling lives. And to quote from the last part of the mission statement, to contribute meaningfully to their occupations, their communities, and their world. So that contribute meaningfully piece is one way of defining leadership. And you can lead from the middle, you can lead from the back, you can lead from the top, you can lead from the side. So what we are doing really is very consistent when we think about leadership and training for leadership, it's entirely consistent with our mission statement. So the what we are doing is we are preparing our diplomats, our diplomat graduates for um, the world. And we are also so we're preparing them to take on the world, but we're also preparing them to do that. Who is that mission important for? It's important for very important. It's of primary importance to our students and their families, but it is also important to employers because they are the ones who will be hiring our graduates. And it's very, very important to communities around the world, communities of every sort and size and purpose. We are really back to that grounding of higher education, which is that higher education serves the public good. And that's something that we can never lose sight of. So where and how do we realize that mission? At FNM, we realize it in classrooms, in labs, on playing fields, on stages, in dance studios, in every possible um, venue on campus. That's the value of a residential campus. But we also realize that mission in the Lancaster community through internships, through volunteering opportunities, through all the experiential learning initiatives that we have already and continue to increase. 
We also do it around the world. We do it through study abroad. We do it through a very wide reaching alumni body. We do it by engaging our alumni, both in this country and around the world. So just about everybody affiliated with the college is contributing to that mission. Faculty, first and foremost in the educational mission. Also, of course, staff. We are all teachers here in one way or another. Our coaches, our Lancaster partners, uh, those who receive our students into their workplaces, and of course, our 29,000 alumni. So we've got this entire community, both on campus and our extended community, contributing to the mission for the benefit of our students and then for the benefit of the public good. How do we measure the results of our mission? How successful we, su successfully we do it? That's a complicated thing to, it's a complicated question and it's a complicated answer. There are many options for assessing our success in what we do. Student satisfaction is one way of assessing it. How the world sees us and understands what we do, the, how we exist in the world of public perception is an important measure. A measure of our success is in how our alumni understand the college now, the college as they attended it and the college as it is now because of necessity and because that's the thing that good institutions do. We evolve to meet changing circumstances and we want our alumni to see what we're doing and know why. And it's also the degree of alumni support we see, which is a measure of our success. Our rankings, are a measure of our success, however flawed and suspect those rankings may be. Our output measures are also certain ways of assessing our success. And for example, we can measure financial return on investment. And f and education is very expensive, just like many of our peer schools who do education the way we do. But we can measure earnings potential and actual earnings of our graduates by taking measures at certain, collecting data at certain recognized points, for example, 10 years after graduation. And when we run those data, f &M compares extremely well on the earnings potential of our graduates, even in the company of the most highly ranked and elite and wealthiest liberal arts colleges. So we know that our graduates go on to earn really good livings. And that's a very important factor when students and their families choose us as their school. It's a very big investment, no matter whether you're paying full price or whether you're aided, it's always uh, as, just about as much as the family can afford. So it's a legitimate concern for them to know that their graduates are going to be able to earn a good living. Another way of assessing is simply by where our students go when they leave f and And one of the things that I have found tremendously impressive and heartening is before the pandemic, but even during the pandemic, and now as we carefully emerge from pandemic to endemic uh, status, as COVID actually unfortunately normalizes for us all, our rankings are, or our output measures, our outcome measures are very, very good. And one of the ways we prepare our students for that and the way we can measure where they land after they leave f and is through our wonderful office with the name OSPAGOD. And that is, of course, as you know, our Office of Student and Postgraduate Development. OSPAGOD is one of our great assets at f and our students and their families know it well. Surprisingly, a very large percentage of our first year students take advantage of what Ospagata has to offer. And then the sophomores, juniors, and seniors just continue to increase their involvement with Ospagata because of everything it has to offer in that bridge from FM to the outside world. Many alumni know it well because they participate as mentors or provide jobs or um, meet each other in that virtual space, or because as young alumni, they too are served, their needs are served by Ospagod. Many of our on-campus community members know Ospagod less well. And so I want to highlight it today as one of our vital assets in preparing students and our young alumni for leadership and for success once they take the benefit of their education here into the wider world. Ospagod happens to be celebrating 10 years of their work this year. It's a great time to feature them. 
And so I have asked some of our colleagues from Aspagad to share this virtual platform with me today. And in fact, I'm going to turn it over to Beth Throne and Marissa Shee from Aspagad to do the next part of the program. Beth and Marissa, may I turn it over to you? Thank you so much, absolutely. Thank you, President Altman. Thank you, friends, family, colleagues, faculty, professional staff, community members tuning in. Uh, myself and Marissa are thrilled to be here. I'm gonna share my screen and um, we are going to share some wonderful information with you. So here we go. Uh, while I'm doing this, I it would be remiss if I didn't tell you that I am um, uh, a class of 1995 from Franklin and Marshall College, go dips and um, please be back at a place that I love. So here's what we're gonna cover during our time together today. Um, first, we're gonna talk about liberal arts and in a way that's very practical, tactical, right? And tangential to why we do what we do to prepare students for success and impact after college. Preparation to succeed, the four C's, and Marissa is gonna go into what that means, the FNM experience, and then impact. All along the way, um, I'm happy to monitor chat and Q&A. So feel free to chat in if something catches you and or Q&A if, uh, um, if you prefer that feature, and we will hit them both. But let's talk about liberal arts. And so the beauty about a liberal arts education is it prepares students not only to solve problems, but to discern what problems do I solve? That is the beauty of the core curriculum. And the core education of a liberal arts experience is saddled across the humanities, social sciences, and natural sciences. Why is that important? That we are requiring students by this education to take classes in these different disciplines, in these areas. Well, here's why. We're looking to produce T-shaped professionals. And what's a T-shaped professional? That is someone who, because of the breadth that they're taking humanities, social sciences, natural sciences, geology, psychology, American history, anthropology, classics, English, languages, and beyond, um, they are going to be able to contextualize across disciplines, communicate with experts around a boardroom translate complex data, contextualize, so that they are speaking the language of the people with whom they are communicating on their team, stakeholders, clients, public media students, right? And then of course our students have majors. And so a liberal arts education, this broad education produces these T-shaped professionals, which is the most coveted recruit today. So speaking about broader preparation, right? Because the education, the curricular aspects is one piece. Let's talk to about the holistic aspects. And for that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Marissa Sheaf, our Director of Health Professions Advising and a leader in the community on developing these pieces. So Marissa. Great, thanks Beth. So as Beth said, we're gonna be talking a little bit about the holistic student experience and what does that mean? Um, and so really when we work with students and we see students in our offices, we really focus on both of the curricular and the co-curricular aspects of what they're doing here at Franklin and Marshall, in the community, in their hometowns, whatever that looks like. Um, we're gonna start with curricular because this tends to be the area that students focused on the least, especially when they're thinking about their careers. They tend to forget all of the really rich experiences that they have in the classroom um, and really focusing on, you know, how does your major and minor come into play? Um, you know, what areas have you really enjoyed studying across? Beth was talking about the core curriculum in your major, if you have any minors, any cadre of courses that were really interesting to you. But then also really goes into all of these other aspects that again, are just not top of mind when students are applying for positions kind of across the board. Off-campus study, did you plan on studying abroad? Where did you go? What did you experience when you were there? How can we help you really connect the dots between living in a different culture, understanding a different worldview, um, and how that relates back to the work that you wanna do when you leave Franklin and Marshall. Um, living and learning, learning communities, obviously within their houses, um, scholarly research and field work. So this um, aspect of working really closely with the FNM faculty is, I think, one of the strengths of FNM. And you know, students have the ability, both volunteering in labs, working independently, um, creating their own projects with faculty. And that is highlighted through the curricular experiences, both in their classroom and then taking that classroom work outside into the lab. 
um, capstone courses and projects, collaborative assignments and projects. So we think about things like community learning, um, you know, working within the Lancaster community and the FNM community, but then also on a smaller scale, like working with your um, different cohort mates and classmates on solving problems and group work. And so all of these curricular experiences, what we do when students are in front of us and saying, these are the types of things that I'm looking for. This is the kind of leader that I want to be. This is the career that I'm looking to get. We absolutely focus on co-curricular and we'll get to that in a minute. But first we start with what's going on in the classroom? What excited you about this major? What are the courses that you've really enjoyed and why? And by really working with students to understand these questions, challenging them, it allows them to build that acumen that they're going out there and understanding the whole perspective of their experience here at Franklin and Marshall College. After curricular, we move into more co-curricular. This tends to be, oh, and I, and I, you know, learning outcomes. I think too, you know, um, for the faculty watching, you know, I think you'll be pleased to know that we really do refer back to learning outcomes um, all the time. So when students, again, this is a great way for us to really reference, you know, what are you learning in the classroom? Um, how is this applicable to what you want to do? We know that oftentimes students will be majoring in a whole range of different areas that are not necessarily career specific. So from working with just pre-health students, I have students that major in lots of different areas outside of the natural sciences. And so it's important that they can really speak to why this major was something that they were particularly interested in. And so we pulled the learning outcomes just for an example of the scientific and, philosoph and philosophical studies of mind, just to really show that we reference these, we go back to these, we have students read over these and really make the connections between what are they doing in the classroom and then how they can really move that forward. When we think about co-curricular options, um, we often think and students often think about, you know, what does this look like in terms of an internship or an experience, but really it's lots of different things, right? So we do have internships and work in there. What's the work that they're doing over the summers during the academic year? And yet there are all these other different pieces that students are getting at in the classroom and outside of the classroom that are really speaking to their own experience. Barbara mentioned a few when she talked about being involved in student government, um, but any clubs and organizations, being a part of that process from the time that you are a first year student until the end um, is really important. It builds up those leadership opportunities. It allows you to create and really hone all of these different skills. Um, volunteer and service, so collaborating with the Ware Institute on Civic Engagement, um, you know, all of these different things, your work study positions. So when we think about sitting down with individuals and they're talking about, here's the career that I want, we often see that they forget about these on-camp on employment opportunities. So we have students that work in Ospagat and things that may not be directly related to exactly what they wanna do, but are really building up these core skills that are allowed, going to allow them to be really successful moving forward. And of course, being a part of um, intramural or club athletics, um, being um, in theater, um, being you know, a part of the band, all of these different aspects are really, again, building into the story of the student experience, what they want to do when they graduate, how that is creating their own brand and story becomes really important when we sit down and talk with them. And it's really this true combination of curricular and co-curricular that we really work with them to connect all of the dots. And speaking of connecting the dots, right, we're talking about what competencies do students need for, to lead in the world and to lead during and after college. And we take these, we are guided by the National Association of College and Employers, or NACE, and the World Economic Forum. I imagine you're not going to be terribly surprised by some of these. And Marissa said how they look in practice, but in form, right, emotional intelligence, um, it is so important that students know how to be socially smart, recognize, read a room, read a team member, respond appropriately, adapt and pivot. Now listen, students and families, if you're listening in, this is the pandemic generation. This is the footnote for this particular generation. And so pivoting is demonstrated. And it's amazing to me that you will find for students who recently applied, there's a question about COVID and the disruption in your education. Graduate schools, employers are asking these questions about how did you pivot during COVID? Not because they're trying to pry into your history, but because they wanna see how adaptable you are, how you problem solve. And so I, I'm gonna leave this for you to see these pieces, but if I were to talk about it in form, right? It is, how do I articulate 
that I've received these competencies. For example, when you interned, and this we have a fabulous student who interned in wildlife conservation. If you're part of a um, team that wins with humility, leads with resilience, or loses, loses with resilience, can lead with resilience as well, right? What does that mean? How do you articulate that? And that is the role of f and in a liberal arts education, and specifically the office, right, that Marissa and I are um, privileged to work in. It is to help students articulate and recognize this. Working as part of the Public Service Summer Internship Program that the Weir Institute runs is pictured here, um, or working as an EMT. These are all core competency building experiences. Headed back just a little bit, right? Curricular experiences, the core competencies, the tangible ways. I saw a question come in. These are the tangible ways that you lead during college. Social change model of leadership, which guides our Harwood Leadership Seminar, our Diplomat Leaders Program, um, our Student Athletic Leadership Council or SALC initiatives, our Building Better Leaders Program, the curriculum for the college houses, right? That social change model of leadership um, it provides that we lead not positionally, but through process, through being conscious of self, by being congruent with our values, right? Um, by getting people around a common purpose. How do you do that in practice? Well, you engage in these co-curricular and these curricular experiences, and that's what our students do during the course of their time with us, with the mentorship of faculty, professional staff, right? Colleagues, alumni, parents, and beyond. So when they are in an interview and they're being asked these types of questions where it's behavioral, so tell me about a time when, you had to um, uh, develop collaborative relationships with others who were diverse, who had a different worldview or lived perspective. You can draw from off-campus study. You can draw from collaborative classroom. You can draw from your um, college houses. You can draw from so many different pieces to show that you're well-rounded. It is so critical. You will have seen and the competencies here, some, um, many of you expect career management. I have to hit on that. Employers expect students to be able to articulate the relevance of their education and their undergraduate experience. So at f &M, we have this acronym um, called OSPAGOD or the Office of um, Student and Postgraduate Development. And it is the role of this office beginning in first year, right? And continuing and beyond to engage students in that process. And we do that via these four C's. Marissa, do you want to chime in on these beautiful four C's? Yeah, and I'll, and I'll add, you know, as we come up on our 10 year anniversary, we really um, tried to think not too long ago, the whole office got together and thought about how can we really concisely talk about the work that we do? Um, what is really the meat of this work? What do we want students to gain in this process? Um, what do we do? And I think that's a good thing to really reflect on every so often. And, um, you know, now that we're hitting our 10 year mark, we came up with what we call the four C's model. Um, and so our role is really to prepare um, adequately students and graduates for success in life and not just work um, by fostering their confidence, their competence, clarity, and connecting them to valuable contacts and opportunities that will support their trajectories um, through f and and beyond. And so our goals really for students and really to prepare them for success are really for them to be competent in articulating their strengths, their experiences, their personal value, um, competing for opportunities during and beyond Franklin and Marshall, navigating the experiences of the working world. Um, this is ever changing. We know that it changes in some fields more than others, but really, um, you know, making sure that students and graduates feel the need to be adaptable and understand that throughout the course of your life, your career is going to take many different directions. How do you respond to that? Some of them will be of your own making and some of them will be more of a forceful um, of the career market. Um, confident in envisioning the many paths that they can pursue, which again goes along with that being adaptable, um, embracing the continuum of career transitions, as I just mentioned, um, and networking. What does that look like? So we have lots of students that come in with their own networks, and we also have just as many 
that come in not knowing what that looks like? How do I build that? Um, you know, what are the individuals that I should be reaching out to? How do I do that? Can I just send someone an email? Um, and it's a really important thing that we work with students on because we know that in this career world, networking is key. And so really building up that network, both at Franklin and Marshall and then their own personal networks as a part of that. Um, connected to a team of caring and supportive individuals in Aspagad and across the university and college, a powerful network of alumni, opportunities for professional development and career success, and then resources. And resources can look very broadly. So thinking about how do you understand um, you know, the diverse lived perspectives of different individuals from something really to concrete. How do I prepare my resume? What's the difference between a resume and a CV? Why do I need a cover letter? Um, you know, what sort of questions should I be thinking about in my interview? And how is that different for an interview for graduate school and an interview for business positions? So really making sure that they're aware of all of those resources and we're providing them to different individuals throughout the course of their, um, their career. And then clarity, why are they doing this? What is their why? What gets them out of bed in the morning and goes to work? Um, you know, it's also important when we were thinking about this model to understand that all of these things are happening simultaneously, right? You can be building up your competence while also gaining clarity. When you're connected to alum and building up that network, that's also part of building that confidence that you have to go off into the working world. So all of these things are happening at the same time, often for many of the individuals that we work with. And it's also important to recognize that this doesn't just happen while they're here at Franklin and Marshall. So the, we see this happening with really young students in their first couple of years. We see this happening later with juniors and seniors. And then we also work with alum 10 years out that we need this because they're changing career paths. What does my why look like now? I'm in a totally different stage of my life. How do I refine this? What are my values? How are they different from when I went into this career initially? So Aspergard really works with individuals um, truly across the spectrum and allows them to kind of connect those dots between all of it um, on the continuum. Um, and so really when we think about you know, our network and what this looks like here at Franklin and Marshall, we really wanted to highlight some of the ways that we're helping our students build this network. Um, we're really big into LinkedIn. A lot of our alumni are on there. It's a great way to connect. Um, but recently we um, purchased a platform called True Blue. And really what this is in simplest terms is a LinkedIn just for FNM individuals. So it's a place for students, alum to come, to reach out, to message, um, to foster connections. Um, we wanted to highlight a couple in particular of, you know, students that really found um, internship opportunities, work experiences just by reaching out to individuals. Um, but I also think it's important to highlight that this doesn't always result in any sort of tangible outcome. Having a conversation with someone about their career path is often just as much as just as much of a benefit, um, sometimes more than having something really tangible like an internship or an experience. And so our alumni have really answered the call of being a part of this platform and working you know, directly with students to answer questions. This is what my day in the life looks like. Absolutely, you can come shadow. Um, you know, here's some opportunities that I took advantage of when I was a student at Franklin and Marshall. Here's how I really marketed myself. And so our alum have been a humongous um, factor in, um, you know, the success of our students and also helping them to recognize what did this look like when they were students and what is this going to look like when I'm outside of Franklin and Marshall. Um, so really, you know, staying connected to that network is really key as well. Uh, and even related to that, um, you know, we have a course on FNM's curriculum call, um, which is a life design course, which is wonderful. I mean, what does it say about FNM, right? That we have a four credit course that's taken by folks across majors, right, um, on life design. And in this course, we talk about networking um, and beyond because it's in our, a lot of what Aspaka does, but we talk about networking being about asking for directions. And why is that important? Because 80% of the jobs, folks, are not posted. And I think um, looking at the list of participants, right, anticipating who may be watching this uh, on recording, you know, you have to get inside doors. Sometimes it's getting the referral. How do you do that? Well, you go through those beautiful connections. And for folks like me, when I came to FNM, I was a first-generation college student. I didn't come with the capital or the knowledge or the connections. So part of our job, part of institutions today, right, especially small, highly selective um, liberal arts 
institutions like ours that have beautiful networks that love this place like I do, right? Um, it's about opening those doors. And so the True Blue Network, and yes, for folks who are listening, who are FNM alumni, family, friends, college uh, um, friends, um, parents, please do join, um, take the call, raise your hand, refer opportunities. That's also something that's really important, those doors where you get them away from those cold, cold searches and get them through those, those places because you know the quality of students coming out of FNM. We had a call this morning in my office with a 1988 graduate who is recruiting a CFO for his financial services firm next week. He does that session. He does not delegate it. He prepares our students, which is why we've had a 10 year track record of students getting into that, um, the internship program, which feeds a full time employment opportunity. That's one example, but that's the power of the network. So when we've been using this term, um, aspagad, right, just to give some context, I know President Altman said surprisingly, walking into our 10th year, I am, I am so thrilled, right, that we have built into our culture this awareness that your discernment, your reflection, your portfolio building, you figuring out, you being students, right, what you want to do, we engage over 90% of the student body, right? And we've done so in each of the last several years, right? Since we began, because it's becoming part of who they're becoming. Not just that end point of a resume, a cover letter. It's working on strengths and values, major declaration. What are you doing when you study off campus? How do you articulate it? How do you articulate being on a team, varsity club or intramural? That's what we are pleased to do here at f &M, and it results in this engagement. So said differently, right, Marissa? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, what we do is really help students connect the dots. We help them draw them, we help them you know, articulate them. What Beth was talking about and just alluding to, when we think about how we do career services here at Franklin and Marshall, it's different than a traditional career office. Um, you know, we are working with students from the moment that they step in the door. And so one of the great pleasures and one of the things that I love the most about my job is that I can see an individual come in as a first year student and by the time they graduate and beyond years from then, see how that has evolved um, and really see how they have begun to find their place in their world and their career that they're looking for and connect those dots. And to be a part of that journey is really, I think, part of um, one of the best parts of, of our job and of Aspagat and of this new innovative career model that we've been working on for the past 10 years. Yeah, and when we say career, by the way, you know, there is no career. So forgive me, I'm Gen X, right? For baby boomers, traditionalists, others who are listening, maybe on the higher end of millennials or the older end of millennials, um, there's no such thing, there are paths, right? So we're preparing students to be able to pivot among fields and industries. There's not one linear thing. And many of you already know that, but if we're not preparing them for um, to live on the pivot point every year, two years, three years, then we're not preparing them for the workforce of tomorrow. And um, that workforce kind of looks like this, right? So we are um, helping over 90% of our students land. And if we don't know after talking about this model where they're landing within um, 500 to 550 students, right? Each year, shame on us. And so we do, we can tell you where 80 plus percent of our students land. And what's interesting, and just you know, by way of education, we've seen increasingly right, that our students are headed to grad school to raise the ceiling of opportunity, um, to employment, and then to entrepreneurship. And this is a trend we're seeing across the nation, that more students are seeking further education before entering the job market, maybe not surprisingly, with the um, pandemic and the disruption to the labor market. But they're landing well, and they're landing successfully. And that, that shows us we're, we're doing something good. One of Marissa, your favorites? Yeah, I mean, I think everyone that's listening can relate to this at some point. You know, um, a lot of times we have very specific plans, especially when we're young, of this is exactly how my life is going to look. This is how my career path is going to look. Um, a lot of our students have a very straight line. And so what we really work on is planting the seed of how can this change? How does this change, as all of us know? And so what I love about the slide is here's what I planned. Here's what happened. Um, and often the best part about this is you can end in a very similar place than where you wanted and yet take lots of different roads and um, that have led you down lots of different paths that were 
incredibly exciting to get you the same point. And so this is a slide that we use a lot because it just really articulates the work that we do and how we, as Beth said, really prepare them for that pivot point and how to be adaptable in this changing market. So with that, I will stop my share, turn it back to President Altman for the next stage. Um, thank you for your um, time and your digestion of what we said. Thank you in advance for who are listening live and via um, recording for referring opportunities. We will post them to that True Blue network so they're not lost among a large database. Uh, and so thank you so much. Beth and Marissa, thank you both very much indeed. And as I hear from our graduates from the class of 20, the class of 21, and now the class of 22, I'm hearing remarkable stories. One of our very distinguished visual artists, a great painter who has combined um, that expertise with the entrepreneurship classes that she took to monetize her artwork and is also simultaneously working as a counselor in her former high school to help students choose their college experience. Um, the young international grad who landed a job in New York City immediately because of an internship he had had. Um, and then um, although he has had visa issues, his uh, Dow Jones for whom he works prizes him so highly that they have given him a spot in their London office, and he's now working very successfully from London. The, the, the number of stories just uh, abound, and they're all multiple factor stories, whether it's graduate school or whether it is entrepreneurialism, our students come out very well prepared because they've got those multiple kinds of competence. So why do we do this? Uh, why do we do this work? It's a hard time to be in higher ed, but we, I think it's probably fair to say that for many of us, we do it because we are deeply committed to mission. To mission. We're committed to making that change in the world, to adding not only to knowledge, but also to preparing young people who to go out into the world our mission is not just a transaction. It's actually an ethical imperative to prepare um, motivated young people who want to engage in our kind of education to be successful in their lives and to be successful in the world and to improve the world. It's not something we do in isolation. We cannot and are not a bubble. We need all of our external constituencies and partners to do it with us. And that's one of the most interesting parts of this whole business. I want to make sure we have at least 10 minutes for Q&A. So I will stop my closing remarks there and invite Anne to moderate the Q&A if you'd like. Thank you, President Altman. And thank you to our panelists. We have some great questions, but there's still time. So you can type into the Q&A any questions you have for any of our panelists. Our first question comes from a faculty member who asks, what opportunities are there for first year students to get involved with and get help from Aspagad? Uh, so we're there on move-in day, um, sincerely. Uh, so that's a, an acquaintance, but to get involved, uh, I'll take one part and then I, I, I'm gonna anticipate, Marissa and I have been working together for a while, which says a lot, by the way, about FNM and reaching to people, I think. Um, but uh, um, coming in for an appointment, starting with that di that discernment um, for first years, our um, career advisors who are known as assistant directors or director of career development, so our career development advisors are there at your bagel breakfast first year students. So um, sincerely, like every bagel breakfast, you will find a Jonathan Lopes for the bees, the Bonchek and Brooks College House, or Jennifer. Um, Rupert for our Where and Wise College House, Ashley Fry for Rochelle. So they're at the College House. There are a number of opportunities throughout the year, um, workshops on leadership development, workshops on um, negotiation etiquette dinners, uh, as well as how to articulate your story. It's not uncommon that Aspagad will partner with the incoming, maybe in this semester, uh, right? First year class president to talk about the keys to success now. Um, other ways, Marissa, that folks can come involved. It means endless, not just appointments, but just being aware. I think one of the main things is just having them come in. So all of us have forward facing calendars. They can schedule a half hour, 45 minutes. I have students all the time that come in and say, I don't really know what we should be talking about, but I thought I wanted to meet you. And it's a great jumping off point for me to say, fantastic. 
I'm so happy that you came in today. Tell me more about yourself. Why are you interested in these things? And, and it creates that relationship. And I really think that that's at the crux of what we do is the sooner that we can get to know students, we can fill in these blanks. By the time they're seniors, we know them. If they're not talking about how they were captain of the varsity football team, I know that. And I can remember, I can remind them of, here are some things that you've been doing outside the classroom that you're just not talking about. Why is that? Did you just not think about that? So these conversations and these relationships, I think with the advisors, whether it's gonna be with one of the generalists or with myself or with Mike, if students are interested in um, STEM and law um, are really important. And so I think the main thing is just have them come in. They don't need to know what they wanna talk about. We will fill in the blanks um, and help them really kind of move forward with their plans um, at FNM. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Our next question comes from a professor, professional staff member. They ask, does the FNM alum network have plans for any in-person networking events in the future? Yes. So we um, we meet our office because we have this PGD, this PGOD, right on the on the on the back end. We meet regularly with um, alumni relations and we are already planning a series of in-person events, um, which yes, networking, uh, we've been talking about returning to our career immersion trips where we would take students to visit and immerse in a city and an industry and cap that off with an invitation to local and regional alumni to join in for a networking experience. But yes, that is on the um, rise. Though I will say, it's not a though, it's an and I will say, um, we have found the pandemic um, gave us a reason to find that virtual networking and virtual programs expands our reach so tremendously. We had 500 students and alum in a virtual experience, not in Zoom, we use a different platform. It was so effective and we had alumni globally that we are repeating a night of networking this year virtually. Um, next week, we are highlighting FNM alumni from very different majors working at Booz Allen Hamilton. And we do an FNM at series. We're doing that virtually, why? Because if the over 70 registrants have told us anything, um, alumni globally want to and are still tuning in. So yes, and yes, we are planning the return to in-person. However, we are gonna maintain that, uh, that virtual programming because it engages people from the comfort, the ease, their offices, their wherever they're joining in. Um, and we don't wanna lose that engagement and being resourceful in that regard. Thank you. We have another question from professional staff. Um, and you said a little bit about this, but could you say a little bit more about some practical examples of how individuals can demonstrate their leadership potential at all levels of their career journeys? Mm -hmm. Marissa, do you wanna take that one? Yeah, so I think, you know, I work with the pre-health population, so I'm just going to kind of use for students to really think about what they're doing leadership-wise at Franklin and Marshall. So if I have student athletes, um, individuals that have been in student organizations from the time that they started, um, the beginning of their studies, moving forward, um, you know, leadership happens at all levels, right? And that can be when you are an entry-level employee, you know, putting yourself on committees to really be part of the campus community here, wherever that organization is. Um, leadership is building connections. It's, you know, again, putting together those dots, um, understanding the, um, the skills that you were, um, taught when you were at FNM and really building as a leader here at Franklin and Marshall, that happens at all different stages. So, you know, I say this all the time to my students that are in medical school and going into health profession programs, you know, there are opportunities for you to take on executive board positions when you're in, you know, starting organizations. If there's things that you're noticing in the workforce that are not there that you think should be, um, that's a great way to exercise your leadership skills, start an organization. Um, build bridges off of things that currently exist. So I think that there are always many different ways that you can create that leadership. Um, sometimes we think that that involves just being the president or the vice president or sitting on an executive board. And yet leadership really comes within these conversations and comes within these moments where you might be the person to say, well, wait a minute, have we thought about this? That's leadership. And so I think really giving the students the confidence to be able to 
um, to be able to do that and to be able to sit at those types of tables can be in executive formats and then can also be just in their general lives um, working and in the community as well. And building on that, if I can briefly, you know, this Friday is the club involvement fair where we're going to have 100 plus student clubs and organizations. Uh, we have upper class students who have been um, emailing their so our, our housing assistants and other upper class students emailing folks they mentor, attend, reach out, join, become involved. Resume, don't put tons of things on that resume. Doesn't help you if you can't talk about meaningful involvement in things that you really care about. Volunteering for the DIP serve, right? That's run by the Weir Institute for Civic Engagement. Showing that you're a leader, leader means social impact. Right? There's no leadership without social impact. And so showing you care about social impact by volunteering, by serving, by starting a club or organization, right? By becoming involved in the college houses, uh, by supporting an event, by just standing for someone who needs your help. These are all very practical ways. And to Marissa's point, leadership is not titular. I guess on a resume, it looks titular, but if you cannot talk about the process that one went to to really develop their leadership competencies, right? It's not a personality type. It's what you become through a process of affecting social impact. So a lot of ways to do that. Thank you. Our next question, this is probably our last question, is from a faculty member. Um, it says, many of us on the faculty are already beginning to field requests for letters of recommendation for students as the new semester begins. You had a lot to say to the community in general about the NACE World Economic Forum Critical Competency List, but do you have any advice for faculty about how these themes might inspire us as we describe our students to potential employers and graduate programs? I'm gonna do a little, I can tell Marissa, you're chomping at this one. When students, before writing any letter of recommendation, we will always, pardon me, before requesting, in person, we say to students, request it in person, don't email, this is pretty big. You need to give language to your faculty member about what you're looking for, what you're using, right? What's the program? Why are you pursuing it? Give them an unofficial transcript, remind them how great you did in their class in case that it's, that's needed. Not that at f &M, the memory doesn't fall short because we are the size. And then of course, a vitae. Can you point to where on your vitae on your resume you showed relevant competencies and give someone that piece? That, that would be my opening, Marissa. Yeah, I would agree with all of that. I think too, you know, um, I see a lot of letters of recommendation as part of what I do. I write a lot of a, a lot of letters of recommendation, and and I always ask students too, what are you hoping? What are the skills that I can highlight for you? Because I think part of the what's missing in all of this is you don't necessarily know who else is providing letters of recommendation, right? And so what they're really looking for graduate schools, um, you know, professional schools, you know, employers is really this 360 view of an applicant, right? And so if you have three recommenders that are all saying the same thing, that's not gonna be helpful to the applicant. And so really understanding, you know, why me? <laughs> and kind of saying, you know, why did you come to me for this? Not in a bad way, but to really say, how can I highlight the things that, you know, you're looking for and then be honest with them about, am I the right person to be writing this letter? I think that that's a really important conversation to have with students because, um, you know, they're not always clear on why and they're not always clear on who I should ask. And so really having that conversation with them to challenge a little bit, um, you know, why me? And, and talk to me about that. And, and as Beth said, providing that CV. I also tell all of my students to provide, if it's not a personal statement, a little paragraph about why you're applying this to this position is really important because looking at um, different job descriptions or schools, it may be clear, but probably not. And you don't want to assume ESP of the individual that's writing your letter. And so I think transparency in this process is really important, um, especially for younger students who are just not used to doing this before. It's a great lesson that they can take with them throughout the course of their career, um, when they're working, um, in the working world, when they're asking for references many, many years from now, it's a great thing for them to learn early on. Thank you so much to all of our panelists today. Our common hour has come to a close, but we look forward to seeing you next week in Bonchak College House and on the 22nd back here in Zoom. Thank you.